You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. My guest is uh, Dr. Philip Metzger. He's a planetary physicist, recently retired from NASA Kennedy Space Center, where he co-founded the uh, KSC Swamp Works. So we'll get into that. He's now at University of Central Florida, uh, still a part of the Swamp Works team. And we, so we'll talk about their research and uh, his current work. So welcome, Philip. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Hi, Richard. Glad to be here. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background, maybe some of the really... Uh, exciting work you've done, and then we'll talk about what you're working on currently. Sure. Well, um, it was almost like I was destined to work in space. My dad worked on the Apollo program, and I grew up in a bedroom community for the space. So everybody I knew, their parents were working out of the cave, and I got to watch all the launches, and I just grew up assuming I would work in space one day. And eventually I did, sure enough, find my way into NASA, worked on the space shuttle for about 10 years. I was a communications and navigation system engineer. And then I switched over to the space station and I worked on the comm systems there, helped to put the space station together and test it and get it ready for flight. And then I went back to school for a PhD in physics, um, focused on planetary science and co-founded the Swamp Works. And I've been working on technologies for the moon and Mars and asteroids ever since. Is the Swamp Works like a less noxious form of the Skunk Works or <laughs> yeah, what does it mean? Well, yeah, we copied the idea of putting the word works, like there's the Phantom Works and the Skunk Works and several others. So we thought, well, what's appropriate? We're at the Kennedy Space Center. It's very marshy out here. And we thought Swamp Works was better than Marsh Works. So we went with that. Okay, that makes sense. Well, what is, uh, yeah, right before we get into the Swamp Works, what are some, you know, since you've been around space and all these missions, what are some, you know, misconceptions the public has about space and exploring space that you know of because you were so close to all these missions and the industry? Oh, well, goodness. Um, that's such a wide open question. There's a lot people misunderstand. But I think maybe the biggest one, the, the thing that's going to affect everybody's life and they don't realize it yet, is that economic activity is moving into space, moving beyond the surface of planet Earth. I mean, for for 50 years or more, 70 years, we've been having communication satellites circling the Earth, but we're on the verge of moving beyond that even. So we're going to start mining on the moon, mining asteroids, and doing industrial activity in space. And um, with AI and robotics on the trajectory they are currently, I think that by the end of the century uh, or a few decades after that, there might even be more economic activity in space than there is on the Earth. So the next 40 to 70 years, I think, are going to be really pivotal in shaping the future of human civilization. And we're we're starting to see it happen right now. So what's some of the initial um, activity in space, you know, driven by economics? And what do you think will be a few years until it's viable or available? Like what, what's the current activity look like? And why? What I like to tell people is that the hard part of space is not rocket science. The hard part is the economics. And in the long run, it looks like it's a no-brainer that we're going to be doing a lot in space. The challenge is, uh, well, in the, and then in the, in the near term, it's really easy to just support NASA, get government grants, government contracts. The problem is the midterm as companies are trying to transition to doing more commercial activity. And it really is challenging to find business models to get through that intermediate period. But because we can see where the end of this is going, a lot of people are working really hard to find a way through that midterm. I think some of the activities that look very promising include making rocket fuel from lunar ice. I've published a paper on that showing that the economics scale very well so that within a few decades, I think there's going to, it'll be cheaper to make rocket fuel on the moon than it will be to launch it off the earth. Another thing people are working on is mining asteroids. You know, that seems a little bit far out there, but there's already a company that is working directly on mining for platinum and bringing it back to sell in Earth's markets. And I have run a business case on that as well, and it looks like it'll work when you get to large scale operations. So they're going to have to find a way to get through the scale up period, but it does look like the, the economic case closes for that. 
So I think those are a couple of the things we'll be seeing. Another one will be making gigantic structures in space that are too large to launch on a rocket. If you had gigantic antenna arrays in space, then you can provide data services that are currently not possible. We don't even think about it because our concept of what you can do is limited by what can fit inside the diameter of a rocket. It's like People say it's like everything in space has to be pushed through a straw up into space, the straw is the, the diameter of that rocket. But once you start to do manufacturing in space, where you can get the raw metal from asteroids or the moon and start to build large structures, you could have uh, antenna arrays that are three or 400 meters across that can put a minimal size beam width, like a one kilometer diameter beam width on the surface of the earth and paint the earth with these tiny beam spots and you could have millions of times greater data rate than what we think is possible using fiber optics or um, cell towers. What do, you, so, what do you mean paint the earth with beam spot? What do you mean? Is this to um, look at the earth with higher resolution or is it to provide a communications network? So yeah. Um, see, the, th the problem is there's only so much bandwidth in the spectrum. And so in order to, to um, get a lot of data up and down to space, you need to reuse the same frequencies by having antennas that focus on tiny areas on the Earth. And so the smaller you can make that area, then the more times you can reuse the same frequencies. And, um, and so that's what will enable going to a much higher data rate. Currently, most data goes through fiber instead of through spacecraft because uh, we can get a higher data rate through the fibers. But we're, we're nearing the point that you can't put the fibers down fast enough to keep up with the growth of data, especially with the way AI is exploding. Um, I think that we're on a trajectory where we have to start moving things into space within a couple of decades. Oh, we have to, or why? Like, what would be the, so I mean, there's, there's some great use cases for items, you know, that are out of Earth's gravity. It would save us a tremendous amount of money, but um, is there a need? To do things in space, like we really what needs is to fulfill that we can't fulfill here. Yeah, so I'm looking really long term, and when I've spoken with people about this before, they misunderstand it. They think I mean like you know we should start doing it today. I think that it's like four to seven decades from now we're going to need to have computer servers starting to be off the earth instead of on the earth. There's never going to be a reduction in the desire for more artificial intelligence because everything you can do with AI is open-ended. Having more intelligence is more economic power. It's more geopolitical power. So I don't think there's ever going to be a, a point where we say, okay, we have enough. And there's, I think there's going to be a constant race to build ever more. And because AI uses so much energy, the manufacturing of the computer hardware actually uses three times more energy than they will burn in their lifetime of operation. So the whole supply chain that supports AI is going to be really bad for Earth's environment um, within sometime this century, unless we can start pushing it off the planet. So, so yeah, I'm talking long term. For nearer term, I would focus more on mining water on the moon and asteroids. There's a business case where within just a few years, you could be doing that profitably. Yeah, I've heard that uh, the cost to uh, cool a server room exceeds the servers by so much that you can almost give them away for free and just make the money again and cost to cool them over time. Yeah. What really got me thinking about this was a book by Robin Hanson. He's a, a researcher. I think he's a Yale. And he wrote a book called The Age of M, where M meant emulation. So he was thinking that before we have general AI, we'll be able to emulate human brains. I think that may be wrong, but he was talking about the end result of having general artificial intelligence and um, how it's going to scale up economically so quickly that we're going to have gigantic cities that, that are entirely servers, popping heat into the atmosphere. And as I was reading his book, I thought this is I think this is dystopian. I don't want the whole earth to be covered by server farms pumping heat into the atmosphere because machines really don't need the earth. Biology needs planet earth, you know, out of the whole solar system. There's only one place that's really perfect for having biological life on the surface and that's planet earth. But we have billions, literally billions of times more resources, and surface area and energy in our solar system off the earth. So um, machines could be happy anywhere in our solar system. We can put machines anywhere. They don't have to be on the earth. And so I think uh, a long-term strategy that humanity should be pursuing, and some people are, is to um, begin bootstrapping industry in, in space. You know, 
I said some people are doing this. This is exactly what Jeff Bezos' vision is at Blue Origin. And that's why he named the company Blue Origin. It's all about preserving the planet Earth, the, the environment of planet Earth by pushing industry off the Earth into space. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's let's talk a bit about um, the Swamp Works. So what um, the premise is similar to, I guess, like a Skunk Works, but uh, what kind of you know projects are, are going on there, have gone on there? There were several of us at the Kennedy Space Center who were working on Moon Mars technology, and we wanted to have a laboratory where we could do this kind of work. And so um, it was Rob Mueller and Jack Fox and I, and there were a few other people, young men and young women, who were working really hard to make it happen. And things fell into place, and we were able to establish the Swamp Works. And our focus was uh, what we call surface systems. So in NASA, you have flight systems, and then you have ground systems. The ground systems are on the Earth. And then when we talk about putting things on the surface of another planetary body, we call that a surface system. So um, the Swamp Works was focused on surface systems, mining, construction, dust mitigation, understanding how to extract resources from the mined products on the moon or Mars. And so we've built a number of excavators and regolith conveyors. Regolith, by the way, is the broken up rocky material that covers a planetary body. So um, how do you convey regolith? from the mining site to the processing site when the gravity is really low and it doesn't flow really well. So there's a whole suite of technologies that we were working on. I retired from NASA in 2014. I've continued to collaborate with the Swamp Works and I, I saw a bunch of the Swamp Works people just last week and they were telling me that right now their main focus is building an actual lunar rover that's built to go to the moon. They're building a flight version of this rover, right? And so that's the main focus at this time. Is anyone looking for a project, you know, produce economic returns, but what it would do is it would fund more easily more space initiatives. It seems like it's always a fight to the death to get funding for various space initiatives. So if they if they grew an industry that became more self-funding and self-sustaining, it would probably accelerate tremendously. Yes. So back at the uh, end of the Apollo program, when it was canceled by Richard Nixon, the last few missions were scrapped. NASA was thinking we were we were going to go on to Mars, and then it was just all canceled. A lot of people were very disillusioned. We kept waiting for NASA to get the next thing going, and it took forever. We started doing the space shuttle, and then it took forever to build the space station. And so a lot of entrepreneurs started talking about, hey, let's just do this ourselves. And they called it Space 2.0, or they called it New Space. They started trying to find business models that would be profitable so that they could self-fund extending civilization beyond planet Earth. I know a lot of these people, they are very idealistic. They're trying to make money, but their goal is not just to have money. Their goal is to make the money in order to fund advancing humanity beyond Earth. So I was at NASA interacting with a lot of these people, and I started to get frustrated because it's, I mentioned the midterm, trying to get through the, the economic business case of the middle region. And as I was talking to all these companies and doing assessments of how can we navigate this economically, I started to think, you know, we really ought to just get the government to bootstrap this because it's very affordable. It's in the range that the government could easily do it. But even somebody like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, it's a lot of money for them. But so I wrote a paper with three other colleagues arguing that the government should just bootstrap industry in space because of all the great benefits we'll get from it. Because then it will it will make everything we do in space cheaper. It will enable us to do much more in space. It'll provide environmental and economic benefits back to the earth. And then I got an email from the White House a few days later after NASA did a press release about that paper. And they said, okay, we want to do it. The problem is there's no way we can get Congress to pay for it. So we have to find the coalition of the willing. Um, for a few years, I worked with Tom Khalil in the White House, and we never quite cracked that nut. It's a tough problem trying to figure out how to get through the, the funding of industry in that middle period. But we had a couple asteroid mining companies that went bankrupt. It was all in the news. You know, what, how many years ago was that? About eight years ago, five years ago. But there's a, a new breath of air coming through the community right now. We're seeing a, a second round of new space startups and they're coming in smarter than they were before. And I think I'm still optimistic that we're going to see progress. Oh, by the way, I should mention two things that are going to be very game-changing. One is what SpaceX is working on. They're building this gigantic rocket, the Starship. It's going to be able to land 
100 tons of payload on the moon. To put that in perspective, that's 100 tons of payload, you know, with the rocket and with the rocket fuel, it might be closer to, I don't know, about 200 tons. But the Apollo landings, the lander, the fuel, payload, and everything together was only 7.5 tons. So we're talking about like 20 times the mass of payload to the surface of the moon. And that's going to be game changing because we'll be able to put lots of infrastructure on the moon very quickly and very affordably. The other thing I think is going to be a game changer is what Blue Origin is doing. They're focused on developing industry and space around the Earth-Moon system. And they've been very secretive, but they're getting ready to launch their big rocket and they're laser focused on the moon. Whereas SpaceX wants to build a city on Mars, Blue Origin has chosen the moon as their main destination. Well, politically, I mean, the moon, I don't know, various countries are trying to land there. How is someone going to set up, you know, permanent operations on the moon? At that point, I would figure other countries would wake up and say, wait a minute. You know, I guess it would galvanize probably a space race to the moon. But again, politically and rights wise, what does the situation on the moon look like? Yeah, there's some thorny questions there. Right now, NASA or the United States government has an initiative called the Artemis Accords, where we're trying to create an international framework to answer these questions. And there's, I forget the number of countries that are signed up. I think it's 30 something countries have now signed up on the Artemis Accords, European and Asian and African and Middle Eastern countries, South American, but notably China and Russia have not signed up and they seem to be working on their own separate initiative. They're trying to build an international lunar station and they're working with a few countries that are very adversarial to the western countries so i don't know it's going to take effort going forward i don't think these issues are going to get worked out until we start doing things on the moon but i hope that as we move forward we'll be able to avoid conflict but admittedly it is thorny good i heard mention of a space elevator i guess a physical elevator somehow that would allow us to transport items uh, closer to the outer edge of the atmosphere and maybe save on fuel. Is a project like that in the works? Is it at all viable the concept? Yeah. I mean, there are some people that are enthusiastic about that idea, but I'm not one of them. It's really borderline to the edge of physics, whether you could have a space elevator using carbon nanotubes. And that's the, the strongest thing we have for strength to weight ratio. The thing is that this fiber has to get thicker as it goes up because it has to support the weight of everything below and it has to get very, very thick near the top. And the problem is getting that much carbon mass up there. And then this cable is going to be degrading because of cosmic radiation and ultraviolet light, and micrometeoroids and space junk bombarding it, you know, chipping it away. So people have argued you can't build it as fast as it's going to be degrading. So I'm not sure it's even possible. But a bigger problem is that if you build one, the amount of mass that you could put up and down that elevator per week would be really low. SpaceX is talking about launching their gigantic rocket something like 10 times a day. So that's going to be like 100 times the rate of what a space elevator could do. So I really don't think a space elevator is going to play much of a role here on the Earth. Now, the moon, it could be different. You know, it's much more viable to put a space elevator on the moon because the gravity is lower. You can make the elevator come from the moon back toward the Earth. And so the influence of the Earth's gravity actually makes it even more benign. It cancels out some of the lunar gravity as you get higher off the surface. And so you don't even need to use carbon nanofiber. You can use an ordinary fiber that we use in industry like Spectra, and it'll be quite strong, you know, quite adequate so that you can put a lunar elevator on the, you know, on the moon. People have also come up with concepts for doing something like an elevator on Mars where the gravity is less than the Earth. So this kind of an exotic idea. It's not really something I focus on. I focus more on the actual industry, the mining, the manufacturing, and I trusting that the space transportation people are going to work on their piece. But what about like uh, microsats or cube sats? Does that have any legs? Programs like that where you have all you know very light, very small form factor. Obviously, you know barely any payload. But would those kinds of objects be able to go into space? Or you know, could you have a mother rocket that spews out you know a bunch of cube sats at a certain altitude? Would there be any benefits to doing that? Yeah, and we're doing that now. There's a lot of right share opportunities that take CubeSats. So when SpaceX launches, they, they'll typically have some CubeSats on board that they'll kick out. The space station has been kicking out some CubeSats. But even the Starlink network that SpaceX is putting in orbit around the Earth is a whole lot of smaller satellites that are launched in a cluster and then they're all released at once. That's a little bit larger than CubeSats. But 
but yeah, it's very viable and it's actually happening. I don't know that there's this gigantic business case for CubeSats and I don't think it's going to be scaling to some major game changing activity, but it's very good for certain scientific applications. Universities are building them for research. It's very affordable to, you can, we build CubeSats at the Florida Space Institute where I am and we've launched them into space. So yeah, it's got its place. I think small satellites like that are also going to be useful in planetary exploration where we can have a ship go out and launch a number of smaller spacecraft around one of the moons of Jupiter, for example. There are a lot of things you can do with swarming vehicles that extend your capability instead of having just one large vehicle. Any major projects that are getting close to fruition or, uh, you know, these are all in various like three, five, ten year timelines and, you know, none of us, nothing major really is it's happened yet. Well, there are a few that are just about to happen. And you remember that Intuitive Machines landed their lander. It tipped over, but it, it was landed and they were able to communicate with the Earth successfully. That was just a couple of months ago. And there's a couple more launches that are going to land on the moon coming up this year, maybe early next year. One of them is going to carry a drill and a payload called Prime One, which it'll be drilling down into the lunar surface at the south pole of the moon and pulling up the icy soil. And then there's a mass spectrometer called M-Solo, which will be looking at the vapor coming off of those drill cuttings to try to determine that there actually is ice in the soil. I'm excited because I got to be a part of that project. They asked me, if I could solve the physics of correlating the amount of vapor flux coming off the pile to the amount of ice by mass that is in the sand pile. And so I wrote software, delivered it to NASA that they'll be using during the mission to try to take those measurements. So I'm excited about that. There's another one coming up um, shortly after that called Viper. And that's a lunar rover, which is going to the south pole of the moon. And it will be driving around with a drill, doing the same thing that Prime 1 will do, but with additional instruments, and it will be mobile. So they're going to try to measure how the ice varies both laterally as they drive around and vertically as they drill in order to characterize the deposits of ice. The ice is important for scientific reasons and for the economic reasons. I've mostly worked on the economic part of it because you can make it into rocket fuel and that can be game changing to make us uh, be able to go to Mars for a, a huge reduction in cost. But the scientific value is that this ice probably came from the disruption of the Kuiper belt, which happened about 3.8 billion years ago, 3.2, I forget the exact number. And we think that that disruption of the Kuiper belt was caused by the giant planets getting in synchronization with each other, kicking each other around. And that event may be what brought water into the inner solar system and carbon, and therefore it helped to make Earth life supporting. So it it's being able to measure that ice and characterize it and understand its history could give us insights to understand how much life there will be at other planets throughout the cosmos. And so it will help us shape our views of whether or not we're alone in the cosmos. So it's really fundamental, the most important science that I could think of to get back there and drill up that ice. And that's going to be happening in just a few months. Has uh, the James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble or both of them been trained on any of the planets in our solar system? And if so, is there any additional data that's come out? Yeah, so I have colleagues at the University of Central Florida who do astronomical observations. I'm not an astronomer, but I do sit next to them and hear them talking about it. They're using James Webb to do observations of Kuiper Belt objects. They're trying to measure the composition of the ice out there in the Kuiper Belt. If you could understand the chemistry, and that'll help us to understand the models of how the whole solar system formed, which helps us to understand the history of the Earth and of our sun. So yeah, they're doing a lot of work on that right now. That's one of the the planetary astronomers are really excited about James Webb because the ability to study the Kuiper Belt, which is the, the region beyond Neptune, it's dramatically greater now with this telescope. Okay. So what do you think is going to be possible, you know, project wise in the next, uh, you know, short term, uh, next five years versus maybe 10, 20 and beyond? Okay. So a lot of space companies that I know are working on technologies. They're winning NASA grants. I, I do subcontracts for a number of these companies. So I'm working with them building lunar rover technology or mining technology or the ability to build landing pads on the moon. And by the way, you were mentioned you were talking about the conflict, possible conflict on the moon. One way to deconflict the moon is to build landing pads so that we're not sandblasting each other with rocket exhaust blowing dust globally at you know six times the speed of a bullet. So we think there may be a business case building landing 
pads on the moon. And so NASA is supporting a lot of this development. Also DARPA, which is a defense agency, they're supporting development of some of these technologies to help bootstrap the commercial activity on the moon. Um, the National Science Foundation is funding some of it. Also, there's a lot of work happening in Europe. Luxembourg, in particular, is funding a lot of the work for commercial activity with the moon and Mars, I mean, moon and asteroids. And there's a lot of work in Asian countries and elsewhere. So right now, it's mostly developing the technologies. And we're also seeing work trying to constrain our models of the resources, like the Viper and the Prime 1 mission and others. China is sending missions to the moon and other countries are as well. So space companies are in the mode of developing the capabilities. They're trying to um, get more investors. But I think we're going to start seeing actual missions by these companies maybe in the five-year window, maybe five years to 10 years from now, we might actually see some of the space mining companies sending missions out to do preliminary work, testing their mining capability on the moon or on an asteroid. In fact, there's actually one asteroid mining company which has already sent a spacecraft up into Earth orbit to demonstrate that they can extract platinum from asteroid metal. So yeah, there's already one that's in space right now. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, where can people go to keep tabs on your work and on you know the the forerunners in space exploration development. What are some recommendations you have for resources? You can find me, and I didn't mention the Stephen Hawking Center. If you don't mind, I'll... Oh, say, sure. Sorry, yeah. really. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was recently appointed director of the Stephen Hawking Center. When Stephen was alive, he flew in reduced gravity, and he told people... Well, that's right on the Peter Diamandis. I did those flights years ago. It was really... Seeing him do the zero-G flight was so inspiring, I ended up doing it, by the way. It was really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah, Peter Diamandis took Stephen Hawking into zero gravity. And he told the world at that time the reason he was doing it was to get the public excited and interested in space. Stephen said, space is our future. Without space, we don't have a future. And so at that time, some of my colleagues at the University of Central Florida contacted him and said, hey, can we found a microgravity research center in your name in order to continue this vision that you've got. And he said, yes. Well, it took a long time to get everything legally organized, but this we've continued working with his estate after his death. And we have finally stood up the Stephen Hawking, Stephen W. Hawking Center for Microgravity Research and Education. We're focusing on how to get the public more involved in space, how to get the public mm. more educated, how to create a pipeline of people of all walks of life to get them involved in space, hands-on. And so we're... Um, of course, we're working with university students, graduate students, and undergraduates, but we're also developing methods to get the general public involved and to, to reach out to younger students to develop programs that will help middle and high school students do hands-on space activities. So I'm really excited about that. We're just now getting these things stood up, but I think it's going to be an exciting program. Let's see, what else what, what was it you had asked me about? Yeah, I was going to ask you about resources for people to follow up, but uh, you mentioned the Microgravity Center. So with the Microgravity Center, just one or two more questions. So is it going to give like a scholarship to maybe a few kids that are interested in space, you know, so they can go on a zero-G flight? Is that what you think will be the inspiration? Or what is it about, you know, the whole topic that you think is going to be most inspiring to young people to get into it? Well, we're still keeping some of our ideas secret at the moment because we're trying to develop them and we want to roll them out. So we're not quite ready to tell the world what we're going to be doing for these educational programs. But we, we do have a project that's in work right now developing classroom activities for middle and high school students that I think will be very exciting. And eventually, I really believe we're going to be taking people into space. I believe we're going to have a Stephen Hawking Center on the surface of the moon, maybe in 20 years. At first, it'll be just robotic. We'll be teleoperating robots. So we'll be having people on the earth building the robots, building the technologies, testing them here on the earth, and then we'll fly them up. We're expecting space transportation costs to go way down over the next 20 years. And so it should become affordable. And I, I think we'll start out with having robotic field test site on the moon, eventually having an outpost on the moon where people can visit. You know, I was telling about this vision to a friend of mine who is um, a NASA person. And I told him, you know, this sounds kind of big, you know, putting people on the moon. And he said, stop. He said, Phil, look, that's not big enough. You know, Stephen Hawking is bigger than the moon. You need to consider the whole solar system. 
And then the next morning I saw him again. He said, hey, I've been thinking about this more. You know, the solar system is too small. Stephen Hawking is the whole cosmos. <laughs> so, you know, right for now, we're going to be thinking about the surface of the moon and asteroids. But but yeah, point taken. Um, Stephen Hawking has a great reputation for revolutioning our concept of space and time and cosmology. He did a lot of work on black holes. So we really hope we can build something that's worthy of his name and also worthy of our university and something that will be very beneficial for humanity, for the future of our civilization, which will actually be taking people into space. You know, back in the days where when the first humans came across the Bering land bridge into the Americas, when they came, they brought their whole community. They didn't just send a few astronauts to go take samples and then come back to Siberia. But the whole community came together. As we start to take civilization into space, it's more difficult than that because you need spacesuits, you need rockets, you need life support systems. You can't just go build a, a log cabin on the moon and with an axe. So it's very capital intensive. And so this is a, a challenge. How can we build ways so that our whole community can go together into this civilization in space so that it doesn't end up being owed by just a few people. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create on-ramps for participation for humanity. Excellent. Well, again, what, what are some resources for folks that want to learn more about uh, all the work that you're doing? And, you know, again, the Swamp Works, the Microgravity Institute, et cetera. Yeah. So um, if anybody wants to contact me, they could find my faculty page at the University of Central Florida. Just search my name. They could also put the Stephen Hawking Center at UCF and find the website there. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Phil Till. That's at D-R-P-H-I-L-T-I-L-L. And I tweet a lot about space. I try to make it entertaining and talk about the, the cool science and the missions that are going on. If anybody wants to partner with us with the Stephen Hawking Center, please reach out. We would love to work with companies and with individuals who have a passion for helping people get involved in space. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And it's really great to talk to you. I appreciate it. It was great talking with you too. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. Podcast.